Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Monday, May 11th, we are studying Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Even as the Christian daily struggles against sin, the reality in Christ remains true. We have been set free from the law of sin and death completely by God's grace. He has declared us righteous for the sake of Christ's death on the cross. Therefore, for those who are in Christ, there is now no more condemnation. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Zelwyn Heidi. Pastor Heidi serves as pastor at St. Peter Lutheran Church in Hanover, North Dakota, and Zion Lutheran Church in New Salem, North Dakota. He's also one of the hosts of the podcast, A Word Fitly Spoken. Pastor Heidi, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Glad to be back with you. Looking forward to getting into Romans today. So we're starting chapter eight, Pastor Heidi, and as Paul picks up, it seems that the last part of chapter seven, I wouldn't call it a digression, but he's what he's going to pick up here in chapter eight is going to go back a little ways in chapter seven, where he, he left off a bit. Can you give us some context, help us connect the dots here in the book of Romans? Yeah, I think if you don't want to use the word digression, I mean, I understand where you're coming from. Digression can sound like it's something is completely unrelated, which is not what the last part of chapter seven is. I mean, he's certainly answering a worthwhile objection that could come up. But what we're seeing here is Paul coming into and picking up again with the main argument that he has kind of set aside for a time being to kind of expand on a side point, you know, an important side point to be sure, but to expand on it and talking about what it means to be, um, you know, dead to the law to, for, you know, because we had the imagery in the first part of chapter seven of a woman who is no longer bound to her husband because of death. You know, likewise, you have also died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. You know, this idea of you are no longer in this old way, you are no longer in the old way of the written code, as it says in verse six, but you are now in the new way of the spirit. And what we're seeing here in the, the first part of chapter eight is Paul kind of uh, visiting this point again and kind of expanding on it to talk about what that means, right? Right. So it's not that you could necessarily skip over 7 through 25 in chapter 7 and and entirely get what Paul's going to start talking about here in chapter 8. But that, right. that language in verse 6, that, well, I guess verses 5 and 6, maybe 4, 5, and 6 even, particularly this matter of spirit, written code, law, though that type of language is now going to come back into play full force here in chapter eight. And so that's that's really where we're going to look for our, our primary context, it seems. Right. And because what Paul had been doing in verses seven to 25 is really, again, answering that possible objection. Well, does that mean that the law is bad? Well, of course not. The law is not evil. The problem is the problem of sin, the problem of the flesh, the problem, you know, and this is what the law had been, uh, what the law came to and caused to flare up, as it were. And that's why when he's talking here in the first part of chapter eight, you know, we have to realize that no, the law the law of sin and death, as he's going to say here shortly, is not a way that could save, but it is the law of the spirit of life, which does save because we are now part of God and part of Christ Jesus through the working of the Holy Spirit. So it's all absolutely related and we can't just skip it over, but it is kind of picking up again with the main thrust, which had been, which started in the first part of chapter seven. All right, so let's go ahead and read the text here in Romans chapter 8. We're beginning at the first verse. Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, 
in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. There is the text for today, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. So, Pastor Heidi, that very first verse, I think, is a a very commonly heard one among Lutherans, particularly, hopefully among Christians. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How How is Paul drawing this conclusion? Well, he's drawing this conclusion by everything that has come before when he's talking about, you know, being dead to sin and alive to God. And even the very first parts of Romans where he's talking about, you know, you who condemn these, who practice these things, you know, and yet condemn them in others. You know, this idea that we all stand under the judgment of God because of sin and because of the reality of the flesh. But Paul after having made all of these arguments, now gets to this wonderful chapter, chapter 8, you know, one of the the, the high points of the, the book of Romans itself, in my opinion, talking about what it means then to be in Christ and to therefore be forgiven in Christ and to receive that full and free uh, remission of sins through Christ and through what he has done. Um, you know, we are set free from the curse of the law. We are no longer under the condemnation, which was part of the old, of the old way, you know, of the, the written code, the way that could not save, but we are now in Christ and therefore have been set free, right? Right. I, I want you to come back to something you said, and I wish I had known this ahead of time, but you, you said that Romans chapter eight, you think is a high point in the book of Romans. I want you to sure. tell me, why do you think it's a high point in the I agree with you, but I want to know why you think it. <laughs> I think it's a high point because what we're seeing is is the the kind of the tail end of the first part of this book, kind of the 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 final conclusions that Paul is going to draw before he begins the next major section, which of course is chapters 9, 10 and 11, before then he would go on into talking about, you know, what that means for us in chapters 12 to the end. So I think what we're seeing here in the the in Romans chapter eight is one of the fullest expressions of what Paul is talking about of you know the gospel of God you know all the way back in Romans one chapter uh, chapter one verse sixteen you know this is what it means for us to be in Christ this is what it means for us to have hope in Christ you know this is the the final concluding driving point that Paul is, has been making all along. You know, there is no condemnation in Christ, and you are no longer in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit, and therefore you are walking in the Spirit. I mean, you could even argue that chapters 12 and to the end, you know, when he's talking about being renewed in your mind, all of that is just a fuller expression of what Paul is saying right here. Mm-hmm. You know, this yeah. is, no. this, it, is, it really is just a high point of the book. Agreed, agreed. And and it is, I mean, just thinking forward in the book of Romans, chapters nine through eleven are, are going to to deal particularly with that question of well, well, what about what about Israel? What what happened there? How does all of this apply to them? And then chapters twelve and following, like you said, are going to draw out very much what is related right here in chapter eight. So this this therefore in Romans eight, verse one, really is a building this conclusion, this huge high point that Paul's got here. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's, that's really important language to be in Christ Jesus, because all of these things have happened to him. And then when we are incorporated into him, 
that's how it's all true for I mean he's he's picking up language I'm I'm thinking particularly back to Romans chapter 6. I think it was it was a lot more of with Christ there. Although you are baptized into Christ. I mean that I don't know, maybe we could dwell on that just a bit, Pastor Heidi, this phrase in Christ Jesus. Why is that such a key phrase for Paul? Well, to be in Christ as opposed to just be with Christ. I mean, this we have been made part of Christ when we are in him. You know, this idea that the spirit is dwelling within us and therefore we are made one in Christ. You know, God, uh, God the Father has given us life in Christ. I mean, it's, it really is a reality of our identity in Jesus, that we have been taken out of the old way. We have been taken out of the way of death, which could not save. And we have been placed into a new way, the new way, which is Christ. So, I mean, this this distinction between you know, what was and what is, you know, this, you know, what we were and what we are now in Christ really is kind of, uh, again, one of the main themes of the book of Romans as well. Hmm. So no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And now he's going to start expounding upon that. So, and this is where we need to be careful, I think. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. He uses the word law there twice. Right. Uh, is Paul using the law the same way in those phrases? Is he using it the same way he's used it previously in, in other chapters? What? How do we sort through this, Pastor Heidi? Well, I think it's worth saying at the outset that when Paul uses the word law, even in the book of Romans, he doesn't mean the same thing in every place. In fact, he doesn't mean the same thing in every one of his epistles. Not that you know he's making something different every single time, but I think sometimes we run into the trap of kind of reducing law all into one basic meaning and then applying it in the same way in every place. And this and chap and verse two here in chapter eight shows us the very you know the very difficult what, what will come of that if we if we use that method because he's using law in two different senses in the same verse. Now. Here in this part, I think what he's talking about is, is he's comparing what he calls the law of the spirit of life, which is, as he's going to go on to explain, the indwelling, um, you know, controlling spirit uh, that we are now being led by the law of the spirit. We are now being led by the Holy Spirit into a new way of life, as opposed to the law of sin and death, which was, as we saw in chapter seven, a... It's not that the law itself is, you know, God's holy law itself that is the problem, but that the law brings forth sin because it kind of inflames it. You know, the, the law shows us what it means to sin, and therefore, you know, sin becomes sinful beyond measure. It's not that the law itself is evil or that it was wrong or that it was bad. It's that sin in the flesh has actually caused all of the problems, which is why he's going to go on to say in verse three, sorry to skip ahead a little bit here, but what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. Mm. It is the flesh that is the problem, but go ahead. Well, and so, I mean, you're bringing out verse three, just to, just to try to trace this word law here a little bit. Mm -hmm. In verse two, the law of the spirit of life contrasts with the law of sin and death. Right. But then in verse three, the law is contrasted with its lack of power versus God's power. So the the use of law in verse two seems that it differs from the use of law in in verse three. That the the big deal in verse two is the difference between the spirit of life, the Holy Spirit, and right. sin and death. Whereas right. the difference in verse three is the difference between maybe more what we would commonly think about as law and gospel. That, that the law and its works commanded could not do what God in his gospel has done. Is that, I mean, is that a fair way of, of sort of sorting these things out? I think so. Um, I think when you're, when you're dealing with, you know, what do we mean by law, law, and law here, which is kind of the question that you're, that you're <laughs> asking, is you know, Paul is, is speaking in a, a very kind of natural way. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, the, the law of the spirit, which again is that indwelling driving force, which we have in, you know, in the spirit being new creations is going to express itself in a, a new way of life, which you could call in a sense, a new law. 
Now, I know we typically tend to use the word law to mean something a little bit different, but and that's okay. All I'm saying is, is this is kind of the way that the that Scripture is speaking here, as opposed to the law of sin and death being what we would probably more typically associate with the way we use the word law. You know, that law which cannot save, the law which um, leads us to do more and more sin, not because the law itself was evil, but because, you know, because of the flesh, which is reacting against the law. You know, uh, this, all of these notions that Paul is using here are not really in contradiction with one another. He, we just have to understand that what the way that he's speaking is just a, it's a little bit different from the way that we usually speak, I guess. I, I think so, because we usually speak, and at least when I say we here, I mean Lutherans. Right. We usually speak of law as it is contrasted with gospel. Right. Law being what God commands, what he demands, that which shows us our sin. Gospel being what he promises, what he does, which shows us our Savior. And I think when we hear the word law as Lutherans, again, that's the we I'm talking about, we tend to default to that. Right. But Scripture doesn't do that. It, it uses the word law in different ways. And I think you're right that this is one of them. So, for example, the, the place where it's, I think it's most important to understand this is that first use of the word law in verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus. When he uses word law there, he's not saying that something that you do sets you free. If, if you think that, then you haven't been paying attention in the book of Romans. But we might be tempted to think that. So, I mean, make sure I'm right there, Pastor Heidi, and then <laughs> let us know what exactly does that, the law of the spirit of life, setting us free in Christ Jesus, how does explicate that just one more time for us? Just one more time. All right. Yeah, I think you've probably already done it. but Oh, that's fine. That's fine. I mean, it, it is helpful because if nothing else, um, maybe this as a side note, you know, our, our systematic ways of explaining things are good and helpful and right. But we can't let our systematics get in the way of how we understand the scriptures. You know what I mean? You know, and this is and this is where sometimes I think we can become so locked into ways of speaking that we kind of stumble over these things. And that's okay. This is why we need to go through it. You know, the law of the spirit of life here is, in fact, like I say, it is the the new way as opposed to the old way. So if you want to go back to verse six, when he's talking about the new way of the spirit versus the old way of the written code, that would be another way of explaining exactly what he's doing here. You know, the, the, the law of the spirit of life being the old way of the written code, excuse me, the law of the spirit of life being the new way of the spirit and the law of sin and death being the old way of the written, of the written code. So again, he's, He's kind of just setting them into parallel with each other and using the word law um, in in the same way that he talked previously about the new way versus the old way. You know, so again, it's just a different way of Paul talking. Right, right. And uh, uh, bringing out the parallel of chapter 7, verse 6 is very helpful. And I think that's putting those two verses side by side really helps us to understand the way in which he uses the word law here in verse 2, so that when he turns around again in verse 3 and uses the word law in a slightly different way, we can we can figure it out there too. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Is anything left in verse 2 before we move on to 3, Pastor Heidi? I don't want, I don't want to make sure I'm missing something there. Right. I think we're good. Okay, so take us then into to verse three, and and now again, I I think in verse three, as he begins to use the word law here, this is more generally what we would think of in terms of law, the commands of God that show us our sin and cannot save us. Right, and you'll note here especially that it's as I emphasized before, this understanding of law is still, I mean, it is still good, it is still holy, it is still righteous, but it is weakened by the flesh. You know, as as he says in that, that kind of digression part of chapter 7, 7 to 25, you know, this is the law coming to sin and sin reacting against it, and that is why the law has no power. It is not that God gave us a something that is faulty or that it is evil or that it is, you know, he was just trying to... Um, that I, I mean, you know what I mean. What I'm trying to say here, the, the yes, law is not yes. evil. 
I, and I think that's what Paul said just right. previously in, in the end of seven, you know, right. for, I mean, for example, chapter seven, verse seven, what shall we say that the law is sin by no means or verse 13 did that, which is good. The law bring death by no means. So this is, right. this is based on what he, like we said earlier, chapter seven, verse six is key language going forward as we've just seen, but we can't leave behind verses seven through 25 of chapter seven either. That's the key background for this phrase right here, that the law weakened by the flesh couldn't do this. And that's what Paul's just been expounding at the end of, of chapter seven. Right, exactly. And so what is it that the law was unable to do? Well, that is to save us, right? And so this is what God has done by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. And he condemns sin in the flesh. That's what the law coming to sin and inflaming sin and causing it to, to become sinful beyond measure was not able to do. But Jesus, in a sense, has come into sin's own arena and he has taken sin head on, whereas the law before spoke to sin and sin just kind of pushed back against it. And so we see a, a transition here between the, the law being weakened by sin and not able to condemn sin in the flesh. You know, it was not able to give us new life compared to what Christ has done in the likeness of sinful flesh in actually delivering us from that to which we are in bondage, delivering us from sinful flesh. Hmm. So again, the contrast in verse three is between what the law could not do because right. it was weakened by our sinful flesh. But what Jesus has done in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, what, what is that saying about how Jesus accomplished that? The second part of verse three. Right. Well, by becoming like us. I mean, to take on our nature, to take on, you know, to become incarnate of the Virgin Mary and to actually become a human being. So that now as man, God has actually, you know, taken taken care of the problem right at its root. Hmm. So part of what Paul is saying there in, in what Jesus has done is that he has done this as a man. This is part of the mystery of the incarnation that right. in Christ, true God has become true man. And so Paul is is fully confessing those two natures in Christ, that he is both divine and human at the same time in one person, that is, as they're, it's more than the, the two natures are, are oh, I'm going to forget how it's rightly phrased according to the Council of Chalcedon, but they're not like two bards just glued together, right? That you could right. somehow separate, but right. they're not mixed together such that they're, you can't distinguish them either. They're, they're united in Christ. So he's, he's holding on to that tension here of, of the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he's also, I think, holding on saying that Christ had no sin. He says the likeness of sinful flesh. Do we see, I mean, it seems that Paul is charting a, that narrow pathway between two errors here. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right too, because, you know, Jesus being without sin yet has become sin for us. Not that he himself was a sinner, but that he has taken on, uh, you know, our sin, that he has carried it to the cross and has conquered it and forgiven it in himself. You know, there's that in, in Christ language again. So you're, you're dealing with the, the mystery of the incarnation as well as the, uh, the mystery of Christ's sin. I, I, I don't know if mystery is the right word, but I, you know what I mean. The mystery of Christ's sinlessness um, that, you know, he could become like us in every way except without actually being a sinner himself. He is the, right. the scapegoat. So Right, right. And then he, he takes our sin upon himself without being a sinner himself. Right. Right. That, I mean, and I, so I think the word mystery can rightly apply in that sense, because Christ takes all the sin of the world upon himself and suffers the punishment for it in our place. God's, God's righteous wrath is poured out on him instead of upon us, because he's carrying all our sins, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But it's, it's not his own sin and guilt. In doing that, he remains the innocent one. He, he never sinned on his own. It, it, it's not, you know, I mean, and so I think right. in that sense, it is a mystery is not a bad word for that either. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh. So 
So with with just about a minute here before our break, Pastor Heidi, let's. I, I think we mostly rounded out. What does it mean then that that he condemned? So God condemned sin in the flesh. In what's the flesh refer to? Is that Christ's flesh? The what? What's that last phrase of verse three here on this side of the break? I I think this is just another reference to that sinful flesh. You know that flesh kind of being the main root problem that we all have. Is not the, not that the law was the problem. It's not you know all these other things, but that the flesh, being that from which sin comes, is actually the problem, and and God is dealing with that problem head on in Jesus Christ. And the reason I bring that out just real quickly, which we'll get to on the other side of the break, is he's Paul is going to make a distinction, a very clear distinction between flesh and spirit, and so we'll see that contrast going forward in this part. All right. Yeah, we'll take a look at that on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on Worldwide KFU. Looking at the first part of Romans chapter 8 this morning with Pastor Zelwyn Heidi. Take a short break, but we'll be right back. Please stick around. Since 1978, Lutheran Church Extension Fund has had the humble privilege of supporting Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and her workers. Thanks to faithful investors, LCEF has provided thousands of church workers, congregations, schools, and organizations with the low-cost loans and resources they need to reach more people with the saving name of Christ. To learn more, visit lcef.org or call 800-843-5233, 800-843-5233. Welcome back to Sharper Iron on this Monday, May 11th. We are looking at Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, with regular guest Pastor Zelwyn Heidi. Pastor Heidi serves at St. Peter Lutheran Church in Hanover, North Dakota, and Zion Lutheran Church in New Salem, North Dakota. He's also the host of a podcast, A Word Fitly Spoken. Pastor Heidi, prior to the break, we left off in verse 3, which is part of a a sentence that continues into verse 4. So, God has sent his Son— in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin, so that he condemns sin in the flesh. And in doing this, Paul says, here's the here's the result, the purpose, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. And that's going to lead us into what you were bringing out before the break, this distinction between flesh and spirit. But before we get there, take us into, well, what was what's this matter of the righteous requirement of the law being fulfilled in us? Well, and this is, again, you know, uh, one of the main themes of the book of Romans, and we would say one of the, the key um, parts of the gospel itself, you know, that even though the law made these demands of us, which it was right to do, you know, the righteous requirement of the law, we were not able to fulfill it because of the flesh, because of sin. But Jesus uh, came and, and has done what he has done in order that this, this requirement of the law you know, in the law and the way that we usually use it might actually be fulfilled in us so that we are now regarded as those who have kept the law, you know, when we are walking in the spirit, right? Mm. So this matter, the righteous requirement of the law being fulfilled in us, and this goes, I think, goes back to what we were saying at the very beginning about the matter of being in Christ, because we are in Christ. What he has done now is done in us, for us, the the righteous requirement of the law, which we couldn't do, Christ has done, and because we are in Him, then this requirement of the law is is in us, and we receive it not by our works, but through faith. I mean, I think in, in just in these four verses, minus that that last part that we're going to get to in just a moment, Paul is going through his first seven chapters all all in one. I mean I'm I'm seeing bits and pieces of, of everything that Paul has laid out the the matter of all unrighteousness and one through three, that gospel turn at the end of three into Abraham and his example in chapter four. I mean I I it seems like as you said at the I don't remember when it was, but earlier <laughs> that this is this is a high point. Paul is drawing all this stuff together right here in Romans eight. Right. Absolutely. And he's going to draw his conclusions from that, I think, as we're going forward, you know, what it means then to be in the spirit as opposed to in the flesh. And, you know, what that means for us, well, even in the rest of chapter eight, you know, what that's going to mean for us in the future and the glory that we are looking forward to in Christ. And, you know, and the the way that he concludes it finally, that, you know, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. So, I mean, 
it really is, it's a very tightly bound argument that it really is recapping everything and drawing forth some of the, the most beautiful uh, gospel proclamations in all of Scripture. I mean, how often have we used the, the words of Romans chapter 8 to console those who are dying? You know, mm. it, this is this is really a, a beautiful passage that should comfort us in the in the midst of this, um, you know, in the midst of sin and death and the world that we live in now. Right. I, Romans eight is one of those chapters that I turn to often for for words of comfort, particular. I mean, the last part of the chapter is a, a regular epistle text at a funeral. And I, I probably don't use this first part of the chapter as often as I should. I tend to default to the end. But but all of that that's coming really is set up right here at the beginning. So this is this is a good a good reminder. So we we left off with that. Paul now is going to to begin to set out this distinction at the end of verse 4 and he's going to draw it out in the verses that follow. The distinction between the flesh and the spirit. And he says again just to to connect to what we've talked about that Christ has given the righteous requirement of the law it's been fulfilled in us and then us, how's, how is the word us described? Us, that's described by this phrase, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. What is this distinction that Paul's bringing out here and is going to draw out in the rest of our text? Well, the distinction between flesh and spirit that Paul uses here is the distinction between, well, those who have faith and those who don't. I mean, when you're dealing with the the, the ways of the flesh, you're dealing with the ways of sin, the way which will ultimately end up in death, and therefore it is the way which cannot submit to God's law, as he's going to go on to say here. Um, this is the way that ultimately leads into um, final condemnation, that we are rejecting God's ways, we are rejecting you know the things of God, and therefore we are walking according to our sinful nature. But to be in the spirit is to have the spirit living within us. And this is something we should probably touch on at a little bit more length. But that God, you know, having come to us and having um, redeemed us, he has actually started to dwell within us. We are now, you know, we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. We are the living stones of God's own holy temple. And therefore, we are walking in a new way, you know, set apart from the world and set apart to God. And so this distinction between the flesh and the spirit, you know, is is the way, again, is the way that we often hear throughout scriptures of, you know, the the new way, the old way, the way of of life versus the way of death, the the narrow way versus the broad way. I mean, (laughs) however you want to term it, you know, this comes up again and again and again. Right. It does. It does. And so how how does this relate? As and I know we're we're gonna get into it here in Romans eight, but this this matter of walking not according to the flesh, but walking according to the spirit, mm-hmm. how does how does that relate to the battle that Paul describes in his own experience at the end of chapter seven? You know, the good that he wants to do, that's what he doesn't do, and the evil that he he hates, that's what he ends up doing. How does, how does that battle that's waging, raging within Paul, that wages within every Christian, how does that relate to this matter of those who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit? Because it seems that at least in, in part in this life, sometimes Christians are walking according to the, or at least it, it surfaces, if I can use the baptismal right, language. Right. How, do, how does that relate? Um, really what we're dealing with here is for the Christian who is walking according to the spirit, there is actually going to be war. You know, there is warfare with the the old flesh. There's warfare with the old Adam. But for the one who is walking according to the flesh, there is no war. There is no struggle. And so the very fact that we are struggling against our sin and struggling against the remnants of sin within our flesh shows that, well, frankly, we have a new master. You know, we have Jesus Christ who has set us free, and we're no longer in bondage to sin. We are no longer under the ways of sin, so that we would just do what sin wants without any kind of, you know, struggle at all. But but now, because we have Christ as our master, and because we are walking according to the Spirit, we are struggling to put off the things that that still cling to us. You know, it really is the, the difference between the one who is fighting against something and the one who doesn't fight against it at all. If we are Christians, if we are in the spirit, we will fight. We will struggle. We will stumble, yes, but we will fight. 
So the the fight, the battle that's described at the end of chapter seven is actually a part of the the walking according to the spirit. Can, I mean, can we say that? I I think so. I mean, as long as we understand that. Um, it's not that sin itself is part of the way of the spirit because that's the old way. That's the way of death. But the fact that we are waging war in the spirit against the old ways, you know, and actually actively striving against these things. Yes, that is part of what it means to be a Christian, to be part of the way of the spirit. Right. So, right. Not the, not the sin itself that would creep up that old Adam that, that loves to swim in those baptismal waters that would drown him. That's, we're not saying that's a part of the walk, but the fight against that, that struggle, that is a part of, of this walk according to the spirit. Because if, if that's not happening, then everything, and I think this is where, where Paul's going to go. I mean, as, as he starts to draw this comparison out, you know, setting your mind on on things, the way of of death, hostile to God. None of that is compatible with the fight against sin. Right. So, so I mean, take it take us into how Paul draws this out then in verses five through seven, Pastor Heidi. So the first thing that he talks about in verse five is he says that those who are living according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, and I think that's actually a very helpful way to look at this. Um, obviously not only because it's scripture, but because what we're dealing with is if we are living according to the flesh, all of our thoughts, all of our desires, all of our focus is going to be on the things of the flesh, which is why Paul goes to such great lengths to warn us against, you know, like what he calls in other places, the fruits of the flesh, you know, or the fruits that ultimately lead unto death, you know, this covetousness, this you know, fighting this, this adultery, you know, all these kinds of uh, the, the fruits of sin. If our life is defined by those fruits of sin, as opposed to the fruits of the spirit, even if, you know, we're struggling against these things, if we are totally defined by those things, are we in fact walking in the way of God? You know, can the one who is walking in the ways of the flesh and actually, you know, just going that way without even thinking about it and just doing it, not fighting against it at all. How can he then turn around and say, I am walking the way of God? Because these things are totally opposed to God. Mm-hmm. There's there's no neutral ground here. It's it's either flesh or spirit, one or the other. Right. And and the verbs that, that Paul uses are are very much, I mean, to just to with that matter of, of fighting, struggling against these things, notice like set their minds on. Or, or even just that first verb, the walking in this way. This is not a, a slip and fall type language, but this is, I'm set in this. I'm, right. I'm walking this way. I'm going that direction. My mind is focused that way. And it's, it's hostile, as he brings out in verse seven, it's hostile to the other, the other way entirely. Right. I mean, so this, is, this isn't just a, oops, I slipped and fall type type of thing that Paul's talking about here. This is an absolute dead set on, on going against the Lord in this way of the flesh. Right. Well, and then also with that language of slipping and falling, you know, we don't want to kind of overlook that either because, you know, to fall into sin is to still fall into sin. Yes, we are struggling, we are failing. And, you know, that's part of what it means to be a Christian. But, you know, we're fighting against that. We're struggling against that because if we don't struggle against that, if we just say, oh, well, it's just a little mistake I made. God's going to forgive me anyway. Pretty soon we're not going to care about that next little slip we make, you know. And so we do want to, we, we never want to give an inch to sin. We never want to give sin ground. And to give sin ground and just kind of relax our guard against it is to start to deviate towards that way of the flesh. And eventually, if we go far enough in that direction, there won't be any coming back. Mm. That's, I mean, that that language about not wanting to give sin an inch really, I think, takes me back at least to, to the first part. No, not the first, the middle part of chapter seven, where mm. Paul talks about, you know, is the law sin? And he says, no, because what sin does is it is it seizes the opportunity through the commandment and and builds sin upon sin. It's very deceptive in that way, it uses that sort of language. And that that's exactly right, that that sin, when you give it an inch, it takes a mile. It, it it's going to you think, or to use the language of chapter six, you know, we think 
we can control sin, that we can be sin's master, but the in, the exact opposite ends up being true. When we when we sin, sin becomes our master, and we fall into that slavery again. And so we don't want to give sin even an inch. We want to keep fighting against it. Uh, Pastor Heidi, one one thing stands out in my mind here that I think we just very briefly want to mention, and and you've you've laid out this distinction between flesh and spirit for us, but I, I think, and maybe I, I could be wrong about this, but I think in English and in our context, when we hear flesh and spirit, we sometimes slip into physical, non-physical. Right. And I, that's I, just real, real briefly, make sure we don't fall into that error here, that flesh doesn't mean physical, spirit means non-physical. Just real, real briefly for the sake of our listeners. Right. Yeah. No, when we're talking in terms of flesh here, we are talking about, for the lack of a better way of putting it, the mindset which is opposed to God. We are talking about the way of sin, the way which fights back against God. We're not talking about the physical flesh itself, because if the physical flesh itself was, in fact, sin, then Christ would be a sinner, which we cannot in good conscience say. You know, it's because he himself took flesh upon himself. What Paul means by flesh is that sin which has set itself up against God. and when But the, the way of the Spirit here, what Paul is talking about, is uh, the way of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, you know, the way of the indwelling Spirit who now lives within us and has made us into his holy temple. You know, so this is the, the way of God. I guess you could look at it as flesh being the way of, you know, opposed to God and the way of the spirit being the way of God or being in line with God, you know, in step with the spirit, as he's going to say uh, later in the book of Romans. Right. Right. And, and so, so that, you know, to be in a walk according to the flesh sometimes happens in very non-physical ways and, and sometimes walk and oftentimes walking according to the spirit happens in very physical ways. So it's, it's sure. not a, yeah, it's just, just to, I mean, cause I, I think, you know, when in a, in a context where we hear people talking about, well, I'm, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Sometimes that sort of thinking gets imported into our own minds as Christians. And that's not the thinking that Paul's got here. He's, he's not, the dichotomy is not between physical, non-physical. It is, as you said, it's, it's the, the ways of man versus the ways of God, the ways of, of sinful man, I should say, versus right. the ways of, of God. So, so, Paul then, and with about 10 minutes left here, we, I want to keep moving into verse 9, because you, you've mentioned this a couple times, that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, actually dwells in Christians. And, and that's where, where Paul goes in verse 9. He says, you are not in the flesh, which is a, a wonderful proclamation to those who, I mean, you know, think about where Paul has has been in chapter 7, the struggle he's he's been describing that happens in himself, the struggle that happens in all Christians. What does he say? He says, you're not in the flesh. You're in the spirit. He declares this to them. If in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Take us into this matter of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Well, and of course, this comes out very prominently in places like the Gospel of John, when Jesus is talking to his disciples, you know, I will send you another helper. And I think that's uh, very fitting because as we're going through the Easter season, at least at least in the one-year lectionary, we're going to be talking, you know, at great length about what it means to have the Spirit dwelling within us and also looking forward to the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. So, you know, this is a, a wonderful time in the church year to be talking about these things. But the, the fact of it is, is that when we have come to faith, we have become a new creation. And now God, in a way far greater than anything the Old Testament ever had, you know, when God dwelt in the temple— God has now made us to be a new temple. You know, he has made us to be the, the greater temple, and therefore God dwells in his temple. And God sends his Holy Spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit, as a way of making us into that temple. And so, you know, this is where Paul comes out, like in Corinthians, you know, don't you know that you are, you know, temples of the Holy Spirit? How can you commit sexual adultery? You know, this the, the reality of who we are is, because of what God has done, because what the Father has done in sending us his Son and in sending us the Holy Spirit, is that we have become something entirely different. And we know that because we are now, we now have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, right? How, how, does, how does this, and I, I don't think that Paul lays it out specifically here, 
how how does the Holy Spirit come to dwell in us as Christians? Well, through the Word, right? Mm -hmm. When we hear the Word proclaimed, when we hear or when we have the Word applied to us, if you want to be uh, Augustinian about this with the sacraments, um, when we have the Word come to us, we receive the Holy Spirit. The, that word creates faith, that word sustains faith, that word is the way that the Spirit comes to us. So when we hear the word, or when we receive the word, we are receiving the Holy Spirit himself, because he is the one who speaks, he is the one who has inspired the prophets to speak, the, you know, the written word. Um, all of these things are coming through the Spirit. And so that's how we ultimately receive him and how we become the, the temples of the living God. Hmm. Through through the word, through the word, you're so you're so Lutheran, Pastor Heidi. You sounded. I, know. <laughs> I, I asked I asked the question, and you're like, I can't believe he asked that question. Through the well, no, but but this is this is a a key a key thing that this is how the Holy Spirit comes to us is through the word. He he doesn't doesn't come in other ways. He chooses. He promises to come through the word, and so we should look for him there. And when we have the word, we should expect him to be there to work in us, to do these things that he promises. It, I mean, it's, it's not a, it's not an empty thing when, when the word is given, this is the, the Holy spirit at work in us. I mean, very just, uh, and we, we know this, we, we learned this early on in, in confirmation, the third article of the creed. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. I mean, that's, and again, to connect to Romans 116, that's the power of salvation for all who believe. Here's the Holy Spirit at work in the word for you to dwell in you so that, so that you belong to Christ. And in fact, I mean, verse, verse 10, I don't know how, how deep you want to go here, Pastor Heidi, but verse 10, it, Christ is in you too. And, and maybe this is a bit of, of a, a mystery of the Trinity going on here in verses. He does start to get very Trinitarian here in, in Romans 8, particularly in the, in the text that follows what we're looking at today. Right. Take take us into, to, we've got about just over five minutes left, Pastor. Right? Take us into verses 10 and 11. Okay. Um, yes, I th you're absolutely right here when he's, like you say, he starts to get Trinitarian. But there's a very good reason for that, because we never want to separate out uh the gospel and to think that it's the work of only one member of the Trinity, which I think sometimes we can run into. You know, we talk an awful lot about Jesus and we should, but do we remember that it is the Holy Spirit who gives us faith as well as the Father who sent, you know, Jesus in the first place? You know, Jesus, God, the Father who raised Jesus from the dead is also the one who will give life to us in our mortal bodies. You know, all of, all three persons of the Holy Trinity are at work in our salvation. They're not reluctant. They're not, you know, holding back. You know, it's not like Jesus is trying to twist the Father's arm in order to forgive us. You know, and he's finally saying, okay, fine. No, the Father is the one who has sent his Son. The Spirit is the one who has come from both and is now, you know, working in us a new creation. So yes, we talk about the dwelling, indwelling of the Spirit, and we should because that's how Scripture talks, but it's not just the Spirit. We have become the living temples of the Trinity. You know, the Father and the Son and the Spirit all dwell within us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's a, you start talking about it, and you, you just feel like you're talking past yourself or in circles somehow, but this is the way scripture talks. And so this is the way we confess, we believe. And it's, I mean, it's a wonderful truth to recognize that God himself dwells within us, that, that we have become his temples all by his grace. And, and this has present effects as really we've been talking about this whole time. But as you, as you mentioned, Pastor Heidi, this has future effects too. And, and we really think about that particularly at the, the great capstone of this chapter verses 38 and 39. I'm, I'm more, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Nothing's going to separate. But, but even here already, Paul begins to, to draw out some of the future implications for this as he talks about what this, this spirit dwelling in you is, means for your eternal life. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and then if Christ is in you, you know, Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. You know, you will have that life. And just as the spirit of him, you know, by which we should understand the father who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. You know, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. 
You know, all of these things are happening because of what God is doing for you. This is, you know, a, a wonderful expression of what it means to have the gospel, to receive the gospel of God, the gospel of what he has come to do for us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all together as one, you know, just as he is in, in all eternity. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that, that verse 11 too. I mean, just the, the pointing towards the resurrection of the dead there in verse 11, that the indwelling of the spirit right now means that on the last day, that the one who raised Christ from the dead, God the Father, will give life to your mortal bodies. He will raise you from the dead through his spirit who dwells in you. I think it's, is it in, oh, is it Ephesians, I think, where, where Paul calls the spirit a guarantee Mm-hmm. or a down payment mm-hmm. of that that the fact that the spirit dwells in us now is this guarantee this down payment of of resurrection of everything that that God has for us on the last day and into eternity. Pastor Heidi, we've got just under 2 minutes for you to respond, wrap things up for us this morning. Well, I there's of course there's so much more that we could talk about here in in chapter 8. You know, sometimes I wish we had more time, but that's okay. You know, but when we're dealing with you know, the, the indwelling of the spirit and the indwelling of all these things, the down payment of what is to come, you know, we are looking at the very heart of what it means to have the gospel, that God who has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son to forgive us and to fulfill the righteous requirement of the law. And so as Paul is going to go on to say, starting in verse 12, which of course will be for your next guest, you know, For this reason, you know, we should not live according to the flesh. You know, that's always his point here. He's making these great, showing us these great truths and making us this great argument so that we then see what that means for us even right now and the hope which we have and will have because of this truth. We are in Christ. We have the Father and we have the indwelling Spirit. And for that reason, you know, let us walk according to the Spirit because God Himself has given us this great hope in Jesus Christ. Pastor Zelwyn Heidi is the pastor at St. Peter Lutheran Church in Hanover, North Dakota, and New Sa- Zion Lutheran Church in New Salem, North Dakota. Also the host of the podcast, A Word Fitly Spoken, helping us this morning with Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Pastor Heidi, thanks for your time today. Thank you. There is now no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are in Christ Jesus. The spirit of the living God dwells in you. You are his temple. Because of what Jesus has done, you no longer walk according to the flesh, but you walk according to the spirit. Even as you struggle, the spirit is yours. What Christ has done is yours. He has come in the likeness of your sinful flesh as a man just like you and yet without sin, bearing the punishment in his body, raised from the dead on the third day, all for you. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithfield, Texas. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.